Good afternoon. Have noticed, hopefully, if you've looked at your bulletin, our title today and what we're going to focus on is Rejoicing in the Lord, and particularly Rejoicing in the Lord Always. And there are several questions which I hope will be helpful in the outline as we look at what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Some of the questions that came to my mind as I looked at this, and I trust that many of you have some of the same questions I do. Does this mean I always have to be happy in every situation that comes into my life? And then why is it important to rejoice in the Lord always? I mean, why are we talking about this today? Why, why is this an important subject? Aren't there more important Christian duties? Isn't confessing my sins daily to my great high priest more important, perhaps, than a need for rejoicing? And say that these are some of the questions that I hope to address today. And I hope that you will have a better understanding of what it means to rejoice in the Lord. Let's start with the word prayer. Father, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit. We know that your Holy Spirit is already here. But this is a specific prayer that that illumination will take place. That words even perfectly spoken, even your word that was just read, the word of God, does not take its effect unless your Holy Spirit is here. Unless your Holy Spirit is working in the hearts and illuminating that word. And even as we would hear your word preached today, it will mean nothing. It will mean nothing if you are not here working in the hearts. And as Brother Eric prayed, help us to concentrate, help us to receive what what you have for us, because we are thirsty. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the uh, brief introduction is to look at these questions. The questions we're going to look at is, what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord always? Am I commanded to rejoice in the Lord? Or perhaps there's a time when it's okay to not rejoice in the Lord. Perhaps this is optional. I mean, it's a good thing, but do I really have to? Or what if my feelings are not cooperating with my desire? I I want to rejoice in the Lord, but but my feelings are overwhelming. And then a couple that you might not blink was how would rejoicing in the Lord undermine self-pity and pride? Maybe that's a problem that some of us have. And then finally, is a rejoicing. Is this rejoicing connected to glorifying God? What is the relationship? Now just so people don't get too alarmed, I'm going to spend a lot of time on the first question because that's where the definition is. So some of you are doing some calculations in your mind and you're going, still on the first question and panicking. Uh, Just want to give you that warning. Okay, so let's first talk about what this does not mean rejoice in the Lord always. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with this phrase that goes around. There's this popular song. You see it on t-shirts. And it just says, don't worry, be happy. Nice little, might cheer up your heart, Dad. And and it's it's kind of a nice song, melody-wise, but Obviously, it's very shallow in many ways and very irresponsible if you listen to the, the lyrics. No, that's not what we're going to talk about today. Just smiling your way through life. And then there's another song that might be for some of a little more history in their lives. And we are not going to be talking today about slowing down, not moving too fast, feeling groovy with no promises to keep. We do have promises to keep. And it's because we have, even though we have these promises, we are going to rejoice in the Lord always. And to see that, we're going to go to the Word, and I expect that you guessed we might go to Philippians 4.4. So 
some of you who know your word. And this is where Paul gives the injunction. Now, it's the same book we read that Eric read out of for us. And he's telling the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And as we know, whenever something's repeated in Scripture, we should take close attention. Now, of course, we should always take close attention to Scripture, but even more so when Jesus repeated things like verily, verily, or Simon, Simon, things that he's saying. Well, here, Paul repeats this. Rejoice. And actually, if you read the book of Philippians, and I hope you saw it in chapter 1, there was that re- rejoice word keeps coming in there keeps wanting to burst forth as really the end goal of Paul says, why am I writing for you? Joy in your faith. You're going to see joy and rejoicing just interwoven in the scripture. But let's look at this uh, scripture in particular. Particularly, it is saying rejoice in the Lord. That's a very important point. We're not just rejoicing in any uh, other thing than God. And we'll, we'll be getting to that. So he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, in verse 4, and I will say, Rejoice. Verse 5, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So this is the uh, immediate context of this command to rejoice in the Lord always. And we see in verse 5, first of all, it's not an unreasonable rejoicing. God is not calling us to a faith that has no reason. A blind faith. You just be singing and I don't even know why. No. We need, there is a reason to rejoice and we need to keep that reason in our minds. Secondly, we see in verse 6 a little bit of this wording that could sound a little bit like don't worry, be happy. It's not necessarily that, that, that there's no truth in that message. That's why so many worldly messages are very effective because often they're based on things out of scripture but of course they don't give you the whole truth and nothing but the truth and that's the danger they give you pieces of the truth but he says and, and what's missing in, but what's in the scripture but missing from that jingle is that he says but with everything be in prayer with thanksgiving So this is the life-sustaining activity. I don't know if you've thought about prayer as a means of grace. I can say I went many, many years understanding it's good to pray, prayer is good. I didn't realize that it was like breathing. I didn't realize that prayer with thanksgiving is so vital. The analogy I want to liken it to is drinking fluids. I think that's a pretty big thing in our culture right now. Don't be dehydrated. Don't let everybody be dehydrated. Well, if you're not praying with thanksgiving, you are spiritually dehydrated. And it, you will quickly be emaciated and not have the life that you should have. So thanksgiving is the important part that I want to bring out of that because when you're battling and you're having trouble rejoicing, thanksgiving is a gift that is given to us. And it's designed, prayer with thanksgiving is designed to replace worry. It's not just to combat worry, like, and, and we do have struggles, but it's actually designed to totally overcome it. It's designed to replace it. It's designed to displace it. If you understand this means of grace, that every concern you have, everything you can bring to God in prayer, but then with thanksgiving. See, thanksgiving is a very important ingredient in that. You may not be rejoicing. 
So what else is, are we told as we read on in this verse? It says the peace of God that surpasses our understanding will guard our hearts and minds. It's also very, very important that peace is this important attribute that is given us here that's like a gauge. You know, when it's hot outside, you may want to look at a thermometer. Of course, now most of us have our cell phones that we're always looking for things on. What's the temperature? And how's the traffic? And we want to try to gauge things. We want to get an idea of what's going on. Well, not just here, but many places in the New Testament particularly, God tells us the peace of God is a gauge in your soul. If you have a lot of agitation, if you have a lot of unrest, and sleepless nights. So there can be battles, there can be physical pains, there can be other things that you're going through. Granted all that. But in your soul, if it's a restlessness in our soul, and we know we're all restless until we find our rest in God. But that's it. Our rest is in God. There is a rest for the people of God. There is a place of peace. And the Holy Spirit brings this shalom, this peace. We know some other verses, like there's no peace to the wicked. There's this unrest. Things may look good on the outside, but internally there's no peace. And yet what we're told in James, the wisdom from above is peaceable and easy to be entreated. So it's one of these gauges that God gives us, one of these litmus tests. We may look at our life. Are we at peace with God? Do we have the peace of God? is the peace of God reigning in our lives. And then it says that this surpasses our understanding. Well, of course. I mean, in our brains, there's just certain limits. I'm sure you've all experienced that. And, and we, we, we see the Apostle Paul even gives these points. He says, oh, the unsurpassable riches of Christ and the glory of God, that, that these things are unfathomable. I always have a hard time saying that word. These, these things are marvelous. Christ is to be marveled at among all his saints. He tells us in 2 Thessalonians when he returns. I mean, this is, this is a good thing. This is, this is what we should be doing. A lot of our Christian life should be marveling at Christ. And this peace, when it talks about guarding there, that word guarding is like an umpire. So it's, it's, it's not just like a catcher guarding home plate. He's not going to let the guy in or a goalie. not going to let anything in. I mean, yes, we do need to guard our hearts, guard our minds, and keep the garbage out. But much more excellent is what we're going to be told in the next few verses and what was in chapter 1 when he said we would approve those things that are excellent that our mind would be occupied. Our mind is so full of the excellent things of God. I guess if I could liken that to the hockey, I guess that that would be so full of glory to God, hockey pucks or something, you can't even shoot another one in. I guess, you know, even, but, you know, it kind of breaks down. But if you know what I mean, you want to be occupied with God. I hope there's enough of God around to, to keep you busy. I hope that you never get bored with God. You might understand. Where do you think the problem is if you're bored with God? The Holy Spirit wants to fill us with good things. So let's read verse 8 and verse 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise. Think about these things. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So we see he's giving us more concrete things to do. He's giving us an application here. And in this sermon, there will be a lot of applications right in the sermon, interwoven. And here's an, here's an application Number one, if you haven't heard of anyone, any application yet, it's telling us to think on good things. Whatever is true and honorable, just, pure and lovely. But we don't need to limit this 
in a Christian religious sense. I think sometimes we may fall into that category or in that, that practice. Now, there is nothing more beautiful than Christ. And there's nothing more wonderful to think of than the glories of Christ. But there's nothing in this verse that's telling us that we can't think about the beauty of creation. That we can't marvel at trees and hills and the ocean. There's nothing saying that we can't be blessed by God as we think about his bountiful creation. We can. And if we go there and think about that and try to think about everything that's lovely or pure, just pick one category and just start, start thinking. I think you'll understand you'll never run out. You keep up things to think about that God has placed in front of us in his creation. And even in this day and age, more than anything, we have such an access to seeing results of science or art and different things that, that, that we just couldn't have seen before. And we should be overwhelmed with the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and the glory of God as we go to meditate. Because we can't even, we can't even exhaust one small area. And this is an amazing thing, amazing thing that God's asking us to do here. Now, some of we just have trouble obeying God sometimes. But the question I wanted to ask you is, is this like a hard thing? Is this, I mean, God's asking you to think on things lovely, pure? I mean, is this painful for you? Now, I'm not naive. It, it might be in some way. We, we have struggles, you know, psychological, whatever. It's real. I'm not going to try to just be too naive about it. But still marvel at the grace of God that he gives us something good to be doing with our time. And ask him to help you. Now we do get very wrapped up in day-to-day duties. We have responsibilities. We have work. We have children. We have some of us. We have maybe we have grown children. Maybe we, you know, we have parents that we're taking care of. There's so many things. But don't let those things drown out your ability to rejoice in the Lord, your ability to meditate on these things. These things are very healthy. They're spiritually healthy for you. You need this time. It's medicine to your soul. Again, it's like drinking the fluids. God's asking us to do something wonderful. Another point with this is the benefits are not delayed. They need not be delayed. You don't have to become a master of thinking good thoughts before you get the back of that. Now many of us, the word practice is in here. It's a practice. It's something we should be doing. We should be practicing, getting better at it. Well, some things, like if you're trying to play violin and, and you're just starting, it might not be so pleasant for either yourself or other people around. But I don't see this activity that way. I see this activity from the get-go. You can get the benefit out of this. The discipline of thinking honorable thoughts and do not let Satan deceive you. Do not let him accuse you. Do not let him come after you because oh, you had a bad thought. It's, it's over. You messed up. You messed up again. It's over. You know, maybe one bad thought spoils it all. God is so perfect. There's just no way he wants it to encourage this activity anymore. Shut it down. I mean, many of you know when you've gone to prayer, I'm sure you've run into certain times where you've just, like, everything would even try to tell you you shouldn't be praying. I hope you've tried to sort out where that's coming from. Yes, sin is a serious thing. And even one sin does make you a sinner. But the gospel, the gospel proclaims the forgiveness of many sins. By one man and by one act. And reread Romans 5 if you really need to get that. But we need to move on. And one thing we need to talk about is is the confession of sin. Because confession of sin is very important. And I raised the question earlier. I mean, isn't confessing sin more important than rejoicing? I mean, rejoicing is... And and unfortunately, in some churches... uh, In some circles, that's the way things are really taught. But I would like to throw another question at you and answer a question with a question. The reason why I do that is because sometimes the second question 
is easier to answer, and it really sheds light on the first question. And this is the question, is confession of sin complete if there's no rejoicing over the forgiveness of sins? i repeat that again. Is confession of sin complete if there's no rejoicing over the forgiveness of sins? Now, confession of sin is vital to spiritual life. There's no question about that. But if you say that confession of sin is greater than rejoicing, I believe that's extremely dangerous. And as this sermon goes on, I hope that becomes clear to you. Why? Because if there's no if there's no confession of sin, you're not really rejoicing in the Lord. So let's get that definition straight. I mean, you might be rejoicing in something else. But if you're not confessing sin, as you come into the presence of the Holy God, you really aren't rejoicing in the Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord includes confession of sin. But the cross of Christ is and always will be our highest cause for rejoicing. This will go through all eternity. If confession of sin does not lead us to the cross of Christ, we are not honoring God properly. If we do not rejoice over the forgiveness of sins, we are not glorifying God fully. In fact, it is a disgraceful thing to fall short of rejoicing in the Lord. And I don't think I've ever thought about that word disgraceful. It means lack of grace. Christ died that we might be able to love Him, to rejoice, to be ravished with His mercy that is unending and greater than all of our sins. Do you really believe that God's grace is greater than all your sins? Is it true? And can it be? The atonement of Christ is effectual. His life of active obedience and passive obedience in his death was the perfect offering and always will be once and for all time the perfect offering for sin. If you need to battle with yourself, if you need to battle with the devil to believe that, you better fight. You better not give up that tenet of the faith. If you believe that, then rejoice and be glad and praise God for his unsearchable riches. So confession of sin is not complete until you come to the place of thanking God for the forgiveness of your sins. Now there's one other major area before we move through questions that we need to look at and it comes from Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 says we know that for those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So let's look at this intently just a second before we move on to these other questions. Does all things mean all things? Yes, I think we know all things means all things. Does that mean that all things are good? No. The Bible's not saying that all things are good. The fall was not good. There's things that happen in our life that are not good. But what the verse is telling us is that God is working all things and he's able to work all things to the good. Do you understand the difference of what's being said? For example, someone dying is not good. Death is not a friend. It's an enemy. I praise God, we know this thing of death will be is dealt with, but not fully dealt with yet. But God is able to use death for good. Samson killed more Philistines in his death than in his life. God answered Samson's prayer, so he was able to accomplish this. 
In our scripture reading today, we saw Paul in chapter 1 and his attitude about rejoicing. He's rejoicing even though Christ is being preached for the wrong reasons and even a horrible reason to increase Paul's chains. But he goes on and he's just saying that my prayers that in nothing I will be ashamed. That Christ will be glorified whether by my life or by my death. The possibility of death was not going to hinder Paul. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now this is not an attitude that's only for an apostle. I'm human and I know how we try to get out of this. We try to, well, that's, you know, no. Paul, in fact, we saw in the scripture earlier, said, imitate me. And with just due to time, I don't have other scriptures to try to convince you of that, but this is not just only the attitude for apostles or those of pastors and elders and people who take on these, these very honorable roles in the church. No, this is for every Christian to be sold out to Christ, to have surrendered all to Christ. So then, how does this apply to rejoice? How do, well, why do we bring up Romans 8.28 and talking about rejoicing? Because our joy is not based on our quality of life or our quality of death. Our joy is based upon something much, much more sure. The work of God in Christ reconciling us to himself. And this work is applied to our lives by the Holy Spirit and His power none on earth or in heaven can resist. And by that I mean ultimately resist. We all resist the Holy Spirit. It's just none can ultimately, successfully resist God. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we can rejoice in this. It's not based on our feelings or our emotions or what we're going through. Our joy is not in our temporal accomplishments, even when things are going real well. It's in the unshakable work of the triune God. And now we can begin to look at these questions. And I think we have the groundwork to answer them properly. So am I commanded to rejoice in the Lord always? Or is there a time when it is okay not to rejoice in the Lord? Now, I'm not going to even fully answer this question quite yet. But I will say that yes, it is a command to rejoice in the Lord always. And that may be a shock. You may believe it's optional, that it's a best practice. It's a very, very good thing to do. But it's not a requirement. It's not an absolute requirement. It's not a sin if I don't rejoice, is it? Well, let's contrast that with obedience. Because everyone here would say obedience is obedience is mandatory. But now think about that a minute. So then you're saying if you obey, but you don't do so joyfully, it's okay. I just can't see that in <laughs> Scripture. There's, there's no way God says you must obey, but you don't need to be happy about it. <laughs> no. I think if you examine this, you'll know that obedience is not full. It's not complete without joy. And it's easy to let's look at a couple types of obedience to just look at these and what are we talking about here? Well, obviously, I think most of us would agree a begrudging, reluctant obedience is a sin. I mean, what backsliding means is a term for that, that heifer leaning backwards and you're pulling it forward. So you're still moving forward. God's moving beyond, but I'm resisting as much as I can. It's not a good place to be. I think most of us understand that. And I hope that if you ever sense that you're doing that, you confess it as a sin and don't try to say it's a peccadillo or 
mistake or some other uh, way you want to try to get out of it. Because you're missing the mark. You're falling short of the glory of God. You're falling short of what God designed you to be perfectly obedient and joyful. Philippians 2.14 tells us to do all things without grumbling. I hope you've heard the good sermon I'm at elsewhere. I'm not going to give one now. That's not a recommendation. It's not a proposal. It's not just the best practice of the thing to do. It's a command to obey. I think we have trouble with that because it's easy to complain. It could be a sin that's rampant in the church. And I was just kind by saying it. It's a lot easier to get very upset about things elsewhere that since I don't even want to name. And yet, this is a serious problem. Why? Why is this so serious? Because we're expressing a discontentment with God's providence. We're impugning the character of God. We're not fully trusting in Him. We're not loving Him. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that the first commandment? To love God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength? Wow, maybe rejoicing is a commandment. Because if I'm not rejoicing, I'm not loving God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. Now maybe you would disagree. Because this is new to you. I mean, this is when, when, when you first start thinking about these things, it's just so new. It's just like, why? I haven't heard a pastor say this, or maybe it's been so long. And, this can't be right. I've, I've been a Christian so long. It's the first time I'm hearing this. Well, actually, if any of you have been Christian a long time, you'd be surprised how the Holy Spirit works. Because I still have <laughs> It's just come up from time to time. You're just like, how could this be? So perhaps you disagree and you're saying, no, no, I'm, I'm content with God's providence. You're, you're making a link here, you're, you're linking things that, that don't really. You know, it's just my neighbors. And I mean, they grieve me. And isn't it right that I'd be grieved with my neighbors? I mean, and, and I'm not even going to say much more. It, it is probably good in a certain sense. You have good reasons that you're complaining. To say that there's probably a thousand good reasons to complain about your neighbor or your relative, perhaps a relative. But what I'm here to tell you today, and I hope you see before the end of the sermon, there's many more reasons to not complain. And it starts with our Lord and Savior, it starts with the triune God. And need I say more? I think mean, who's bigger here? I mean, what is going on when our relatives or our neighbors cause our gaze to move away from the most beautiful being in the universe and the one who demonstrated his love to us in an unspeakable way that's so glorious could never thank him enough. Well, what about another type of obedience that, that you're not reluctant, but, but you're not joyful. I mean, you're just kind of neutral. I don't really know if neutral can really exist when you're... Can you, can you really be neutral about God? I mean, are you for him or against him? But let's, let's just suppose just suppose there is a some kind of neutrality, and maybe there's sometimes we feel this way at least. But it's not a valid excuse for disobedience. Well, I feel like doing much worse. I didn't feel like doing that. No, that's, that's no excuse. And essentially the point remains that we're not obeying God if we do not obey with joy. So let's come to the next major question. What if my feelings are not cooperative? 
when I desire to rejoice in the Lord? That's a very real question. I mean, say you're convinced you need to rejoice in the Lord. Say, say you're convinced even that you need to confess the sin of joylessness. That you need to be serious about that. Or confess the sin of not trusting in God and His provision when you find yourself grumbling and complaining. Well, to answer this, let's look at Psalm 42 in the Old Testament. This is just an excellent, excellent insight into the battle for the mind and the soul in Psalm 42. And it's in the Old Testament, which is really cool because it shows even the Old Testament saints had much of the same struggle. They didn't have all the faith revealed that we have. So there's even much more. We're more accountable. But if you look in Psalm 42, you see, of course, first that this psalmist is thirsty. God loves it when we come to him thirsty. And he wants to appear before God. But when you get to verse 4, he remembers the house of God. He remembers the songs of praise. Actually, let me back up just a little bit. He's dry, he's thirsty, skipped over his pain. His tears have been as food, he says, day and night. While they say to me, where is your God? Who are these people? These people mocking him seem like friends, like Job's counselors. And they don't understand how they're displeasing to God. They are tools of Satan in this case, jeering this psalmist. But, what we see in verse 4, he remembers the house of God. He remembers how he would go to the, with a throng, with a lot of people to the house of God. He would even lead in the procession. And then something happens here that if you have one takeaway from this sermon, I hope you take this away. He begins to preach to himself. He begins to preach to himself. I hope this sermon is not the only sermon you hear today. I hope that you're preaching. I hope that you learn to preach to yourself. You and only you know from the Holy Spirit the depths of your soul and your sin. And you need to use the Word of God. You need to be armed with the Word of God. This doesn't mean you have to be a great scholar or anything. You just need to have the Word. And you need to preach to your own soul. You're the only one who's always with yourself. And this is what he's doing here. He's saying, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He's preaching to himself. Now some people might make fun of you if you talk to yourself. I don't know. But actually I think we have a good biblical reason. You can preach to yourself. Your new man can preach. And there's nothing more powerful than the word of God. He's preaching to himself. And then he says in verse 6, he, it, and it's almost like that first little sermon he gave himself, God and beyond the house of God to God himself. Now he, in verse 6, he remembers you he's talking to God from the land of Jordan. Deep calls into deep, but the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and waves have gone over me. The grandness of God is overflowing him at this point. He has moved beyond the house of God. Now, if we go back to the Philippians 4 verse, it talks about thinking about good things. Sometimes when we're having trouble becoming thankful, it's not, I'm not going to say this is not a big rock to push up the hill. Sometimes we are recalcitrant. That means we're very stubborn. We're not easily moved. But I think all of you must have some that might 
And I hope it's just not Dunkin' Donuts. Probably shouldn't have thrown that in the sermon, maybe at the stomach one. But something that cheers your heart, even if they're memories, even if what you're going through now is so bad, there was some time in your life God was good. It was something. But you begin to count those blessings. And maybe you can start with creation. Just start with anything around. And maybe you'll get to the brethren, you'll get to the house of God as you start to ascend the steps of worship. And maybe you'll get to God himself. I hope you will. And he gets to God. And he's overwhelmed. And he says, by day, in verse 8, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I s- now, now, he's real with God. It's kind of the song winds up. And I don't view this as a falling away in the last few verses. And I don't have time to spend a lot more time with this song. But I want you to see how he preaches to himself. But he's also very real saying things about, like, why have you forgotten me? Or we remember the prayer of Habakkuk. Very, why? Why can you? How can you use the Babylonians? How can you use the Assyrians? How can you use these wicked people to judge your people? I said, that's another sermon. So, he remembers God. If you're having trouble keeping that in sight, that there's a reason to rejoice, remember, there's a reason to rejoice, remind yourself. Preach to your soul when it's not cooperative. Now, the Word of God is powerful. You know, concluding that point, what's more powerful, your soul or the Word of God? The Word of God. Okay. We can, we can repeat that a few times if we need to. If you're struggling with that, and sometimes our soul's a pretty big struggle, maybe you need to read more of the Word of God. Maybe just flip to some other book even. I believe the Holy Spirit's got something there for you. I have a hard time with, with all that's here. I have, you know, if when I open this book and I get nothing out of it, I'm not walking. There's no good reason. Now, maybe if you have to run out the door right then because you're late to work, well, then that was my mistake. I didn't allow enough time. I, I, I boxed the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you've got to speak to me in two minutes here. No. But then, then I'm going to make sure to catch up at night. And maybe God has something to say to me. Because there's a lot in here. And it's great to be reading through the Bible in regular places. Sometimes you just have to turn somewhere else. Because the Holy Spirit is directing you. And wants to convict your heart using that piece of word God. And if, you're, if you've got the word open in your drive, please try it. Give the Holy Spirit that opportunity. But the word of God is definitely, there's no comparison. As Brother Art said, the word of God much more powerful and able to convert the soul. So now I'm going to tie this in as we move towards wrapping up here with two with, with two points that may not you may have not have thought of in respect to rejoicing. And how does rejoicing undermine self pity and pride? How, how do they relate? Well, pride is the primordial evil in creation. You trace it all back. If you study your work you'll see it's, some could argue, the most serious sin. Absolutely. All sin, all rebellion, everything is coming out of pride. And Satan lifted himself up against the most high. We know this is the very first sin ever by any created being in all of Scripture. Well, self-pity is pride in disguise. I want to bring this up because we've got to uncover it. It's, it's really a place where pride can hide. And pride is a serious sin. So John Piper, in his book, The Dangerous Duty of Delight, this comparison with self-pity and boasting. So self-pity is the response to pride, of pride, to suffering. 
Self-pity says, I deserve admiration because I've suffered so much. Just add a little woe is me. But let's contrast this with boasting, a more obvious form of pride. And most of us hate people that are just arrogant. I mean, I mean it's just like, you, almost want to, you just want to get away from them. Boasting says, I deserve admiration because I've achieved so much. Boasting is the voice of pride in the heart of the strong. But self-pity is the voice of pride in the heart of the weak. Boasting sounds self-sufficient, but self-pity sounds self-sacrificing. So you can see how self-pity can, dis- can disguise pride in a way that in Christian circles, if we're not careful, we may even accept it. It's, oh, wow, they're suffering so much. They're so humble. They've been through so much. But the reason why self-pity does not look like pride is that it appears to be mean. But this need is arising from a wounded ego. It's not arising from a truly humble heart, a heart that's humble before God. Self-pity arises not from a sense of unworthiness, but from unrecognized worthiness. I'm going to repeat that again. If you really believe you're unworthy, you won't be having pity for you. Because you're not worth crying about. Self-pity arises from unrecognized worthiness. It seems subtle and worthy of pity. So self-pity is unapplauded pride. It's unrecognized pride. Self-pity is pride in disguise. So to see a truly humble heart, how does rejoicing uh, combat that? It's in Psalm 84.10. You don't need to turn there, because it's just going to be one verse, but you can turn there if you wish. Never would want to discourage anyone from opening the Bible pages. And his brother Tyrone's not with us today and physically, but in spirit, you know he is. And this is one of his favorite verses. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. See, in this verse, the psalmist is rejoicing in the Lord. He doesn't need status among peers. He delights to do the will of God. He's not in a self-pity mentality because he's only a doorkeeper and the other guy is a pastor or the other guy is a deacon or... God is his all-sufficient joy. His circumstances matter little. He's not bemoaning this duty of being a doorkeeper. He's rejoicing and he's content in God's providence. This is where God has placed him. This is what God has provided for him. So rejoicing in the Lord undermines self-pity and pride in several ways. First, our eyes are focused not on ourselves but on God who made us. When we're rejoicing in the Lord, we're focusing on God. Second, we realize that God is great and powerful and good, so something good must be going on right now. No matter everything, how everything seems, something good must be going on because God is good and He's still alive. He hasn't died. He's still in control of the whole universe. Something good must be going on right now. And the most important thing, I know about the most important thing. It's God. And and He's good. Totally dwarfs our self-pity. Then we realize how much bigger God is in all of our problems. And even if we combine all the problems of all the human race, of everybody who's ever lived, and let's even add in problems because of the curse on creation, just like Adam all. It's nothing. Nothing compared to God. So when it comes down to this, 
we ask ourselves, well, okay, that's all good. I know God's good. I know he's big. But is he for me or against me? And that's the question of that I have me be. Okay, he's the elephant in the room. He's, he's the big issue. We, I understand this, but is he for me or against me? That's where we may struggle. But you know, I think we need to turn that question. And we need to turn that question and say, are we for God or against Him? This is our final point as we come down the home stretch here. Is a relationship between rejoicing in the Lord and glorifying God. I hope by now, resoundingly, in your soul, the answer is yes. We're created to glorify the Lord. There's almost nothing more fundamental than that. I don't have time to go through all the scriptures to show you that at this point. The deepest joy and satisfaction you will ever experience is when you see God glorified in your life, whether by life or by death, or whether by thought or by deed. In fact, Jonathan Edwards wrote a book in 1755, even before my time. And it, the title of the book was The End for Which God Created the World. And in this he writes, God is glorified not only in his glory being seen, but in its being rejoiced in. When those that see it delight in it, God is more glorified than when they only see it. His glory is then received by the whole soul, both by the understanding and by the heart. God made the world that he might communicate, and the creature received his glory, and it might be received by both the mind and the heart. Now you know that's a message we hear here regularly. Rejoicing includes and shows so clearly that your heart's involved. And I'm sure that many of you experienced times when you were weak and when you were tired. But then when maybe somebody made you laugh, maybe something made you happy. And this I don't want to I don't think we should sit with a big Christian mind right now and like belittle that. But it gave us strength. Something about that joy, something about that it cheered our soul. There was a real result. And we weren't as tired. Maybe we got a second win. God has worked rejoicing and joy into his creation. Surely I bet more than one in the, the audience today has thought about this scripture, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So God is glorified not only with his glory being seen, but in its being rejoiced in. So when we do not rejoice in the Lord, we do not glorify him as we ought. And this is the definitive answer to the question earlier. If you didn't consider it the fully answer, am I commanded to rejoice in the Lord? Is there time when it's okay not to rejoice? Again, if we answer a question with a question, try to clarify the situation, let's ask this question. Is there a time when it's okay not to glorify God? Is there a time when it's okay not to glorify God? I almost, I almost don't like asking that question. No. The answer is no. And we see in Psalm 42. Now God knows our heart. He knows we're with us. He knows we struggle. We see it saw that clearly in Psalm 42. Too. We struggle in the face. We lose sight of God. We're forgetful. We do not remember the goodness of God. We doubt and struggle with unbelief. And struggling is normal in this life. And that's because we have remaining sin. But we must confess these struggles are sinful. Don't feel like a hero. Don't feel like a marine because you had such a great struggle with sin and, you know, you're overcoming. I mean, it's good to struggle with sin. It's good. 
And it's much better than surrendering. Or quitting. No one's talking about quitting here. But struggling is still sinful. Because we're falling short of the glory of God. And we will struggle. We will struggle in this life. Do you think you will not be a sinner in this life? But we need to be careful in our mind about what and why we're glorifying God. It's not because of our struggle and our great heroics. Or maybe even prayers of confession that are very long. History is full of people who probably confess more sins than any one of us in this room. And maybe they never saw the glory. They never saw the face of Christ. They never saw redemption revealed in its beauty. Because they never came through to worship. They never came through to true worship. They never came through to thanksgiving. They never believed that their sins were on the cross. That they could never confess all their sins. They could never number them all. Even if you didn't confess them in detail and name them, you can't even number them. You can't count fast enough. But they're all there. They're atoned for. Don't be content with joylessness. Christ died that you would be joyful. That you would know that you could glorify God in the fullest way. Don't forget the joy of your salvation. Now, salvation is not just a future day in heaven. Sometimes we're allowed it gets narrowed in our mind of when will you say and it's this point in time and, and yet and then I'll be fully saved then we use the word that way but there's also words like justification sanctification glorification to begin to help us identify different points in time that salvation encompasses that but your salvation is in the here and now you are saved now if you know the Lord and that's what the psalmist in Psalm 42 is remembering the Lord. The salvation applies now. Regularly remind yourself of the grace of God and never give up the fight of faith. If you surrender it, it, it may indicate that you never knew. And if you struggle with assurance of salvation, at least struggling is some sign. So we've reviewed and gone over what it means to, to rejoice in the Lord. As we look at some of the questions, is it always important to rejoice in the Lord? Yes. Isn't confessing my sins daily a greater need? No, I wouldn't say it's a greater need. It's an important need. But true confession will lead you to worship and rejoicing. Is it a commandment? What if my feelings are not cooperating? We've looked at that. How does this undermine the worst sin in the world, pride? The worst sin in all of creation? Rejoicing in the Lord is the antidote, is the remedy. And finally, this relationship between rejoicing in the Lord and glorifying God. And I want to leave you with this. If you've ever seen the beauty of the Lord, if you've ever gotten a glimpse of who He is, and we're not just talking a physical glimpse in any way, it's very deep in the soul. How can you settle for anything less? And as the psalmist who said one thing I have asked so now, I desire to see you. The beauty of the Lord is revealed in Christ. It's revealed through the forgiveness of sins. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was incarnated. No other faith, no other religion, there's no other God that has come and dwelt among us. And they said, and John writes there, I am and we beheld this glory, the glory of the only God. And then he goes to a glorious death and a glorious resurrection. It was glory, by the way. Christ being buried with a rich man in a rich man's tomb. I mean, there was a rich man in there, but that wasn't the way people were normally buried in that time. When the Romans crucified somebody, they were thrown in Gehenna. They were thrown in the garbage. It's disgraceful. Dishonoring. 
No, even in Christ's death, and I don't have time to go any more than that, there's glory. There's glory all through His life. If you've ever seen the beauty of the Lord, the glory of God, how can you settle for anything less than rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Holy Word that is powerful and able to convert our souls. May we never forget all that you have done, even the little bit that we know, even the little glimpse that we can see. It's truly enough for us. It is well with our souls. Help us to love you. Help us to see the first and greatest commandment love you with all our mind and heart and soul and strength. And when we're struggling to rejoice, may we avail ourselves of the means of grace, praying with thanksgiving, counting our blessings, opening up your word and saying, I'm thirsty. Show me the joy of my salvation, which is here and now. It's not just something. We thank you for this wonderful, wonderful grace that you've given us. May we walk in it. We ask in Jesus' name.